Welcome to Corel Draw for Laser Engraving, session number five. I'm Jimmy Dubose, and I'm going to be covering several topics in this session. Let's get started. The first topic we're going to cover is Object Manager. Object Manager, which is now called just Objects in the current version of Corel Draw, allows us to split things up into different layers to control whether they're displayed, whether they're locked, or whether they're printed. To turn this feature on, you go to the object menu, and at the bottom of that menu, you have objects as an option. I have it already checked here, so that means that it's already in my dockers. Let's take a look at layer number one, which is our layer we have everything in right now for this job. You see I have a group of objects. If I click on that, you can see it highlights the graphic I have here at the bottom. If I click on text, you can see it highlights the text. And then I have some vectors that I'm going to end up welding to do the cutout on this. Every single object, you can either hide it or you can lock it so that it can't be edited. On the full layer itself, you can also hide the entire layer. You can lock the layer, which means that it can't be edited. Or you can set it to not print. This can be very useful in a complex layout, so we're going to demonstrate how to use that. First, what I'd like to do, let's finish my cutout. So I'm going to select these two objects. As you can see over in the Object Manager, it shows that they're highlighted. I'm going to weld those together. I'm going to hold down my Shift key, and I'm going to click on the outside outline. And I'm going to do a different type of weld, back minus front, to finish up this cutout. Let's create a layer for those vectors. Go to the gear up here in the Object Manager Docker. Come down to Layer. Go to New Layer. And we have a new layer. I want to rename this layer, so I'm going to right-click on it. I'm going to come down to Rename. I'm going to call it Vector. I want to move this curve up into that layer, so one way to do that is to simply, with your mouse, click and drag it to that layer. It's now in the vector cut layer. If I decided I wanted to cut this in two parts, I want to do the engraving and then come back and finish the vector portion, I can set this to not engrave. When I go to print, You see here in our preview, there's no vector. Assuming that I, I engraved the raster portion of this image, the text and that graphic, now I want to do the vector cut. Let's do the same with layer one. Let's go and turn off the printing. Go back to our vector and let's turn the printing back on for the vector. Let's take a look at our print preview. There's no text, there's no graphic now, just the vector portion. In this next example, I've taken a graphic for an outline of an acrylic award off of the JDS website, and I have it here in one of my layers. Over here on the right, you can see I have my award outline. If I turn and I hide that view, you can see that it disappears. I want to set that to not print because this is just to show me the shape of the acrylic award. I don't actually want to engrave those red lines. I've done another section here called job notes. The job notes are tells me who the, who the uh, supplier is, JDS Industries. It gives me the SKU number. It gives me a description of the award. It's the diamond acrylic with the silver edges. And I have my resolution, my speed, my power, and also telling me that as an operator, I should reverse this image or mirror it. These topics are locked and they're set not to print. So none of these notes are going to print on my finished result. And you'll see that in our print preview. Sometimes it's easier to select objects 
from the object manager. Instead of clicking inside my work area, I can just click on the image right here and it selects it. When I'm going to engrave an award like this, many times it's easier to have the bottom portion of this flipped upside down so that it's up against my ruler. We're going to use the mirror tool to do that, mirror it vertically. Well, since my text also needs to match that, I'm going to select my text and I'm going to mirror it also vertically. Now let's scale it so that it looks, it fits inside the shape of my acrylic. So if I hold my shift key down, it'll keep it centered as I scale this image down. And let's go ahead and use my cursor key to nudge this. And visually, because that's italicized text, I need to go to the left just a touch. At this point, we're ready to engrave. Go to print. In our preview here, you can see there is no vector outline. There are no notes. So Objects Manager is very, very useful in this application. Here we have a template. In this template, we have several layers. This is a steel plate or for a steel plate that has already been pre-printed. So everything in blue has already been printed. And we need to actually engrave in the rectangular areas. Um, that's what has all this variable text here with the carrots on either side. It's set up for doing a print merge. If we take a look at this non-print layer, which is set to not print on this icon, let's turn it off. This layout now is ready to do a print merge if I need to, but there's no reason to make that disappear simply because it's set to not print. If we go to our print preview, you can see here all of our text is, is the only thing that's going to output to the laser. The final example I want to show here for Object Manager is creating an inlay. We're going to take this graphic image and create a marquetry or an intarsia type design where each color is going to be a different veneer. And it's going to build the image by doing that. Well, I have my graphic here that's all vectors. What I need to do is I need to separate these into different layers so I can cut each veneer separately. Also, I can use the same graphic to laser the pocket that the veneer is going to go into. Let's create a layer first. Let's rename that layer the color that I want to use, let's call it gold. Now I can click and drag the different designs that are gold up into that layer. That's one way of handling it. I'm going to use uh, cut and paste instead. So I'm going to select the item I want. I'm going to come up into our um, toolbar up here and I'm going to select cut then I'll go to my gold layer and I'll come back and I'll select paste. Let's do the same thing with the other layer. Let's go ahead and let's select cut. And then we'll go back up here and we'll select gold and we'll select paste. One of the nice things about the later versions of CorelDRAW is it doesn't just give you the color over here inside the object manager, it shows you the shape. If I was looking for something that was green, I could select that, that's part of the thumb. As I scroll down here, I can select in other items that are green and work my way through. This is very easy, makes it much easier, I should say, to edit any kind of graphic when you have not only the color, but you also have the shape. These little thumbnails I've found to be very useful. Let's minimize layer one and let's hide layer one. We have this graphic now that we're ready to do a veneer. So I'm going to select everything. I'm going to come up over here and I'm going to right click to change to an outline color of red. I'm going to left click to turn off the fill. This is now ready to send over to cut out our veneer for this particular color. What about lasering the pocket that's going to go into the wood where the veneer is going to fit? Well, let's 
go ahead and let's fill this with black. And now it's ready and I can, I can right click on the slash to get rid of the outline. And now I'm ready to laser the pocket. So this tool is very, very useful for doing this kind of separation, these color separations. The next topic we're going to cover is creating tables. So I'm going to work through a very basic table example here to show you how this feature is uh, used. If this is the first time you've created a table, normally you have over here, you have just the A for text tool that's displayed. If you click on the bottom right corner, you have a table option. This is the first time that you've done this, you need to go and set up your tab key so that when you go to edit your table, things will, will be able to scroll through the table as you uh, expect. Go to Tools, go to Options, go to Tools again. Select Table as your option. And we want it to move to the next cell. We don't want it to insert a tab key in the current cell. Then you can select the order with which you want it to move through the cells. We uh, typically want it to go left to right, top to bottom. Click on OK. Once you have the table tool selected, you can click and drag with your left mouse button to create the table. Now that you want to add text, you can click inside the cell you see that my text is really large. Well, let's, let's back up here. Let's come back over here to my uh, text tool. And let's say first, let's select it. Let's select the table. And then let's go to our text tool. And let's do some formatting here. So we want all of the text inside this table to start out with a smaller size text. So let's type in 10 points right here for my letter height. Uh, let's change my justification to center. And then over here in my dockers, I'm going to go to properties. And under properties, I have an option here for frame. And you have this icon right here, which is vertical alignment. For the table, we really want center vertical alignment. Now that we have these preferences set, we can start to type in our text. And I've already typed in all the text over here. Let's select this. And we're going to hit P to center it to the page. And then I have a couple of graphics here that we're going to use here at the very end. So I have all my text typed in. And what I want to do now is I want to change the spacing of the cells. Some of these cells need to be much narrower and some need to be wider. For example, the name needs to be wider. So we're going to click on our tool for the table. We're going to select our table. And let's go ahead and let's move. By using your mouse key, you can actually click and drag. And we can make this column much narrower. We can do the same with this column. If I come to the side, you can see that you can click and you can select an entire row. You also can select an entire column and you can do all kinds of editing once you have those selected. If I want to select just, a, just one cell at a time, it sometimes it's hard to select it. What I'll do is I'll zoom in and you see when you get that little plus key right here, this allows you to select that one cell. Then you can zoom out. Um, if you decide that you, you can just click and drag if you want to drag through certain items here to select different cells, or you can hold down the control key and you can add different cells and you can make changes once those are highlighted. I want to select the text here. And let's zoom back out. I'm using the scroll key on my mouse to do this. And let's select all this text here. If I come over to my properties, Docker, 
I can increase the size of that text until it takes up more of that cell. All right, let's select the very top header row. And I'm going to right click now. And you have several options here where you can actually merge cells, split into rows, split into columns. What I want to do is I want to insert a row above this one. Now I want to merge those together. It's going to end up being the title of this particular layout. Let's merge those cells together. And let's type in the text that we have that we want to put here. We'll change the font. We'll increase the size. Oh, that's too large. We'll make sure that it's centered vertically. Okay, so I want to change my text color of each of these uh, lines of text here, so I'm going to highlight these. Let's, let's highlight this text here. Actually, before we do that, let's make these bold. So I'm going to highlight everything here. I'm going to come over here to my text menu, and let's make sure they're bold. All right, now I want to, let's zoom in here and swipe through this. And let's change the fill color to white. We're gonna do the same thing for each of these. Let's change this to white. And these are individual cells. So changing the color of the background is available, but it's not allowing me to change that for each of the text items. So I have to do those individually. Now that I've done that, I'm going to select that entire row and I'm going to change the background color to blue. With the item selected, let's select the entire table. And up here you have in the um, property bar, you have different options for the border outline. So I want to do the outside in a much thicker line. So let's make this, let's say, 0.1 inches. And then I want to select the inside portion, and we'll make that a little bit thicker too. Let's hit the letter P to center that to the page. Now I want to take these graphics and for the nationality of each runner, I want to come in and I want to put that into my table as well. So I'm going to copy the Jamaican flag and I want to get into text mode and let's paste that in. This is going to be treated like text, so what I need to do is I need to swipe through it and I need to increase the size to fill up that cell area. So about 21 is the largest I can do here. So let's select, let's go ahead and select the USA flag and we're going to copy that as well. And get into text mode and click here and paste it. And let's type in 21 points for the size for that graphic as well. Now I should be able to just highlight this and copy it from here now and 
paste did not retain the size. So we're going to do the same thing. Let's do 21 points and click in here and paste and highlight and 21 points. And then we need to copy the USA flag. We'll delete these two images that we used, and at this point, we're finished. The next tool that I want to show you is the Power Clip tool. So I'm going to take this graphic that I have here. I'm going to create a, um, a sign. So I have some vectors and I've got this graphic here. So what we'll do is this image here, I'm going to break this image apart. So we'll go up to our object menu and we're going to select break curve apart. And I have these two inside portions of this outline for some glasses. I'm going to hold down my shift key and I'm going to select the two inside parts and I'm going to duplicate those. Let's go to Edit and come down and select Duplicate. Let's go ahead and let's combine those together too. What I did not mention is that I already know the distance where I need it to be is 5.5 .5 inches. So you can see I have a nudge set to 5.5 .5 inches and I have my duplication distance set to 5.5 .5 inches. Let's select our glasses that we have there and let's combine those back together. And let's fill those with black and let's turn off the red outline. All right, so what I want to do is I'm going to use Power Clip to get rid of all of this drawing, all of this photograph except for the eyes. So I'm going to click on the photograph. I'm going to go up to Object. Under Object, I'm going to go to Power Clip, and we need to select Place Inside Frame. So now with this arrow, I'm going to take and I'm going to point to that frame. All right, let's turn off the outline color. And let's use my Nudge tool to nudge that down to my eyeglass frame. Now let's group this together. So we'll select it, go to Object and select group. And then we're going to hit the letter P to center or we can go to object, go to align and distribute and select center to page. I have my text here that I'm also going to center to page, but I want it to be, you know, of course centered over the top of this graphic, but I want the text above and below. Let's go to our shape tool and increase the spacing between our two lines of text by selecting this icon over here I can actually drag this out so that I have some separation let's hit the letter P again still need a little more separation so let's go to my shape tool again and finally let's hit the letter P and there we have our sign On this next example, I have a graphic, a 3D graphic, if you will. So you can see the grayscale in the image. And what I want is I want that the actual pattern to be inside my text. This pattern is called a French diamond. So what I'll do is I'll select my text. I just want the vector outline <clears throat> at this point. So I'm going to come over and I'm going to left click to turn off my fill and I'm going to right click to give an outline. 
Let's select my custom pattern here. We'll go up to the object menu. Under object, go to power clip. Select place inside frame. Finally, click on the text. And we can come over and right click on the slash to turn off the outline. This text will actually engrave with that pattern. One final way to use Power Clip is to create a much larger design. Even if we have a very small laser, we can engrave, say for example in this case, 12 by 12 pieces or tiles to create this larger image. What I've done here is I have a large photograph. With nothing selected, you can see that my size is 48 inches by 48 inches. So this could be some tile work I'm going to put on a wall or I'm going to put it in a walkway, uh, maybe out of some black granite. I created a frame. This frame, or there's a bunch of red squares basically that are all individual. I need to select all of those together. So let's go back to my objects menu. I need to select all these rectangles. So I'm going to click on the first rectangle. I'm going to hold my shift key down and I'm going to come down and I'm going to click on my last rectangle. Again, I'm doing all of that over here in the object menu. Much faster, much easier. Now I must combine those. So on my property bar, I'm going to click on the combine option. Your frame that you're going to use for cutting has to be combined as one object for it to work properly. I'm selecting my photo, go to the object menu, again select power clip and place inside frame, and I point to the frame and left click. Now if I go back to object and I come to break power clip curve apart, these are now individual pieces that I can engrave. So if you engrave these one at a time and then just like a puzzle, you can reassemble those whenever they go to be installed, you can create a very large image in this fashion. Even if you have a small machine, you can do this. Power Clip is a very useful tool. Next we're going to discuss 3D versus uh, dithering. 3D is a very useful tool if I look at the artwork I have here. So let's say I have a grayscale image and I'm going to zoom in on this grayscale image. This image was created for 3D. All of the white areas are going to be based, are going to be raised, all the darker areas are going to be deeper. So that's going to create a contoured effect into the material that you're going to engrave, whether that be wood or whether it be acrylic or if it's some other material like a sign foam. If I'm engraving a photograph, I don't typically want a 3D image of a photograph. It's also not set up to really give you a good 3D image. You've got shading that's right next to one another, and you're not going to get a nice smooth contour that you would get with this previous design. Whenever I'm going to engrave a photograph, what I really want is I want a dithered image. This image, if I zoom in tight, is nothing but black and white. That's going to give us the best result to look like a true photograph. Now, how do you control this option? When you go to print, there are settings within the driver that control these settings. If I go to my preferences for my laser system, under the Advanced tab for an epilogue laser, you have the option for Basic, you have the option for 3D. If I select 3D, then it's going to give me the contoured version that I was discussing. Where white is at the highest point, 
black is at the lowest and you have a, a graduated colors to create that contour. And every single gray level ends up being a percentage of the power. So zero is gonna be 0% 0 of the power downloaded. Um, where you get into say 50% black is gonna be 50% of the power that was downloaded all the way to 100% black, which will be full power. If I have basic selected, what's gonna happen is it's going to use whatever dither pattern I have here if the grayscale has not already been processed by Photograve or some other software. So if we go over here, I could say, for example, select Jarvis, and it's gonna give me a nice error diffusion dither. So the term dither, really what it means is taking a gray color or a, or a color and converting it to black and white using some sort of an algorithm or pattern to make it look good. So inside the driver here, we have Floyd Steinberg, Jarvis, and Stuckey, which are all called air diffusion type dithers. That means that they're going to give us a splattered effect where it's, it's based upon the intensity of the colors around it, whether the color's on or off. If you have standard selected, standard is more of a pattern. And that pattern is uh, really good for some clip art, but not so good for photographs. Here are some graphics, uh, some finished samples showing dithered. This is alder over here on the left-hand side. This is maple over here on the right. And this is a piece of acrylic that's engraved here in the middle. In each of these cases, they were dithered so that those grayscale images would come out and give you really nice contrast. A 3D image is going to give you different shading Instead of giving you different shading, a 3D image is going to give you different intensities. And those different intensities are going to give you variations in depth. As you can see here on this fish scale graphic design, which is the same image that I have uh, that I showed you in CorelDRAW, um, you can get that uh, basically a variation in depth based upon power. Here in the middle, these are some acrylic samples. This one's not painted, but it's the same fish scale 3D image and the top one up here has been painted. Finally, over here on the right, we have a really uh, detailed graphic that shows scroll work, and it shows, of course, the, the eagle uh, seal and everything here, and it show, you can see the variation in the feathers, you can see the variation in the scroll work, and all this is done with grayscale with 3D selected. Rubber stamps, there's another application that you can create with your laser. I have a couple of designs here, and these are ready to actually send over and engrave. Uh, the driver in our laser uh, can actually automatically reverse this, which means that it basically it can turn all the areas that are black here will be white, and it also will take the background to black. It'll also mirror the image automatically. To do this, we must create what's called a fence. I'm going to select this graphic. I'm gonna hold down my shift key and I'm gonna double click on the box rectangle tool over here. Hold down my shift key again, let's make this a little bit larger. Let's do the same thing for these other graphics. Let's hold down my shift key and let's double click here. And let's make this a little bit larger. And let's do the same thing here. These vectors have become a fence. And what this fence means is that everything that is inside this box is going to be engraved. All of the black areas are going to be white and they're going to not be engraved. They're going to be raised. If I want to use the laser to cut these out as well, then I must have another vector to the inside of this. To do that, I'm going to use my contour feature. over here under the effects menu. If I select all these items and I combine them together, I can then adjust all of my contours at the same time. So over here, I want to step to the inside. Not very much. I'm just gonna step into the inside by let's say a 16th of an inch and I'm going to click on Apply. 
that's a little too much. I'm actually touching my graphic. So let's zoom back. Let's go ahead and undo that. And let's do much smaller. Let's do 20 thousandths. And apply. So again, the outside line here is used for the fence. The inside line will end up being a cut. As long as they're both hairline, then that's how this is going to work. When I go to print, and I go to my preferences, over here under advanced, I must have stamp mode selected. You can see that I have mirror selected and I have fence selected. That corresponds with my artwork. I have a shoulder of 25 and I have a widening of one. This preview right here is actually a side view of the stamp. When you're actually using rubber stamp, this gives support to the letters. So as I increase the shoulder, if it's a much softer rubber for the rubber stamps, you'll see that the shoulder gets wider. If it's a harder rubber, I can actually decrease the width of the shoulder. Again, you can see the preview changes as I do that. 25 is a default for most laserable rubber, but if you're using a foam rubber, then you can go through and you can increase that width. The widening, what it does is it gives a wider appearance to the top. So if you had, say, for example, a signature stamp where the signature was really narrow or you had some narrow parts of your artwork, you could widen it here. One seems to be the most popular setting. Of course, you have your speed and your power based upon what you want to engrave, or I should say, uh, what wattage system that you have. And you click on OK, and there's our preview. Now, the preview is not going to show that it's mirrored here or that it's actually been reversed. That's going to happen whenever it goes to the laser itself. There's a macro that I'm not going to cover here, but I want to demonstrate. I'm not going to cover in detail, that is. We have another video that does an excellent job of covering that. Um, I'm going to use this uh, rubber stamp, which gives us a much tighter cut. So we're going to run that. And let's do our first offset that's round. Let's go ahead and create the contour. And looking at that, that's actually pretty good. So what this does is it gives a much tighter cut around the rubber stamp, where the whole rectangular area is going to be rastered away, but then the vector inside cut is going to be much closer to the stamp itself. Going back to our print driver, let's discuss some of the sections within the print driver. Resolution. Most of the time, the resolutions that you're going to use are going to be 600, 400, or 300. A few exceptions might be that if you actually want to engrave onto fabric, you might run at 200 or even 150 uh, to prevent from burning all the way through the fabric. Almost nothing is engraved at 1200 DPI unless you just want to have a lot more overlap, maybe if you were trying to engrave very deep into some material. But 600, 400, and 300 are the most popular. Job type, raster versus vector. These should really say this is raster only, meaning it's only going to output the raster portions of your design. And vector is only going to output the vector portions. If you have combine selected, what will happen is it's going to go through and it's going to engrave all the raster first, followed by all of the vector. Piece size. This can either be the size of your layout inside CorelDRAW or the size of your material at, that's in your table. So this could potentially be 24 by 12 if I'm engraving a standard piece of plastic. Over here on the left, you can turn autofocus on and off. You also can change your justification to center center or other reference points, left center, top center, or page center. Center center is by far the most popular. And it corresponds with setting a home position at the laser itself. You can set this to send only to the laser or to send to job manager at the same time. We're gonna cover job manager in just a second. Up here on our right, we have our raster settings. So we have speed and we have power. A basic rule of thumb of how this works is for most materials, the slower the speed, the darker the burn. 
in power, the higher the power, the deeper it engraves. So in our example, we talked about engraving a photo. Uh, I might want to have a slow speed of say 50, but I don't want to engrave too deep because then my pixels will touch one another. So I might also decrease my power. Engraving direction, bot top down versus bottom up. Uh, this is a very useful tool whenever you have residue that's pulled into the areas you've already engraved. For example, if I was engraving some plastic that was red surface with white core, and I was engraving from the top down, some of the pigment from the smoke, because of the airflow when it exhausts, when it exhausts toward the back, um, will actually stick inside the white letters that have just been engraved. However, if you do bottom up, all of that residue is being pulled across the material that has not been engraved yet. So top down for most materials, but if you have residue sticking inside your characters, try using bottom up. We covered dither methods already. Then we have vector, we have speed, we have power, and we have frequency. So if I had, say for example, was cutting some acrylic and I had a speed here of 10, I had a power of 100, and I want to get a nice glassy edge, I'm gonna have my frequency all the way maxed out at 5,000. What this does is, again, the pulsing is almost continuous, so therefore my edges are fire polished. If I was engraving wood and I use that same setting, what's gonna happen is it's gonna give me a black scorched edge. So for wood, I'm gonna use a number much closer to 500. We also have vector sorting, where you have inside out versus optimize. So inside out, if I was engraving, uh, for example, a Christmas ornament that was a snowflake, I'd want the inside portions to cut before the outside. That's simply because I don't want the outside to cut first and the material to drop. If the material is not perfectly flat and it drops, all the inside portion cuts will not be aligned with the outside. If you have material that's perfectly flat, Optimize will work through your drawing and cut it out the fastest possible way. So that if I had, say, some flat cardboard I was cutting and I select Optimize, um, I've had some customers with intri intricate cutouts tell me that they can save up to 20% of the time on the job simply by selecting Optimize. But again, this is not the safe setting if your material is not flat. The safe setting is inside out. Under advanced, you can see over here that I have many different material settings. Uh, started with about 44 that came from Epilogue, but as I go through and try different materials, I will go through and I'll add those material settings. So to do that, you have all your settings over here in the general tab set the way that you want them. Then you go to advanced, you go to save, and you give it a name. So let's say this was for mesquite wood. and it was going to be at 400 dpi. So once I hit save, that'll now be in my list of different material settings. If you want to load a material setting, then what you want to do is you want to select, say, the setting for birch plywood, and you want to click on load. And then over in the general tab, it'll have all of the settings that you need for that particular material. Color mapping, which I'm not going to cover in much detail here, Let's just say that color mapping is used when you want to assign different speed and power settings for colors. Also, if you want a color to engrave before another color, I can actually bump that color up to be first in the list. We're gonna take a look at Job Manager now. Job Manager is very useful if you want to set up a bunch of jobs that you want to run at a later date. So, or let's say that you're the primary operator, but someone's going to help you out and run some jobs for you when you're out of town. You can create those jobs and it captures all of the power and speed settings. So when I come over here and I click on advanced, you can see all of the speed and power settings for this job as it was saved, as it was printed. And you can change those settings. You can also come in here and you can put notes and you can say, um, use and um, and then we can come over we can save that so whenever the operator comes in to run this particular job they'll have those settings 
in all the notes. All these jobs can be loaded up. We can delete them. Um, we can, again, um, they could be queued up. Uh, you can print directly from these as you launch these. You can go and you now send it over to your laser. Uh, this is using the latest job manager, which works with our Fusion Pro system, which you can see already does all the color separations for us over here. So red is a different separation automatically, green's a different separation, so on and so forth. But job manager is a very useful tool to go through and um, again, create a queue of jobs that you're going to run at a later date, or if you just simply have a job that you engrave all the time or you engrave it, say, once a month, you can actually create that job, have it in, in Job Manager, and then print it as needed. Thank you for attending our Session 5. Go to our YouTube channel if you want to see more videos. Please let us know if you have any questions.